Welcome to the More Demand Podcast, where we help you generate more demand for your products and services. Every episode, we give you tips, tricks, and tutorials on how to get the best out of your digital marketing. Less frustration, more demand. Here's your host, Lawrence Howlett, with this week's freshest tips. Hello and welcome to the More Demand Podcast, episode number 40, the big 40. All right. So this week we have with us Edda Holgan. He is a serial entrepreneur, digital sales and marketing expert and best-selling author. With over 15 years in the industry, helping businesses scale, grow and develop their marketing strategies to become Fortune 500 companies. He's not limited himself to big brands either. He's been involved in plenty of innovative startups. So for everyone listening, this show is for you because we're going to go through the exact steps from idea to testing those ideas, to launch, to resources, what you need, and as well as Edda's whole story through his drive, desire, and persistence, being homeless at 13, doing night school, learning how to communicate with people, having multiple jobs, Wow, it's an awesome story that we've got lined up for you. Nowadays, Edda is the CEO of LiveVo, a web platform that transforms simple images or videos into captivating and revenue-generating content that collects real-time and emotional sentiment and reactions. So without further ado, let's welcome Edda onto the show. So Edda, welcome to the More Demand podcast. How are you doing? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure, absolutely, and thanks for coming on the show. and And I've read your story, and and frankly, it's uh, it's quite an amazing one to where you've got to now, from living on the streets in Colombia to becoming an award winning entrepreneur. That must feel like quite an accomplishment. Uh, it is. I, I really, I'm very proud of the things that I have achieved. It's all uh, pretty much a lot of drive and hard work, um, as I tell people. I'm not smarter than a lot of the people out there. It's just, I guess, what separates me from a lot of the usual suspects is, is the desire to do things and persistence. Just, I'm, I'm a very, very persistent person who, when it sets his mind to do something, I just continue to push and push and push until I get it done. Yeah, so I mean, you, you mentioned a, a couple of big words there straight off the bat, and that that drive, desire, and persistence. So, just fill us in on the the backstory of, of you know where how you got to uh, to where you are now, and how you know maybe you applied some of those drive and and desire elements um, to to your work life. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I grew up in Colombia. I lived homeless uh, in Medellin during the 80s, the time of the narcos and the cartels of Medellin. Uh, so I lived homeless from the ages of 13 to 17. At around 17, I started with an American who was living in Medellin, a business selling products door to door. And I spent some time before that working for other people selling products. I sold, you name it, I sold the shampoo, cosmetics, uh, all kinds of different things. And it was very hard work, uh, you know, eight, o- 8 o'clock in the morning, up and running, knocking on doors in the hot Medellin sun and 80 something degrees. Uh, and then I went to school at night. So I spent a lot of time learning how to talk to people and being comfortable around strangers and things that were not very normal for me because of my upbringing. Uh, I came to the United States when I was 19 years old, did a lot of the menial jobs, worked at restaurants, I cleaned rooms, I worked at motels in uh, New York cleaning and doing all sorts of things. I moved to restaurants, waited tables, uh, and I finally kind of came as a realization of someone who I interviewed for a job who told me, why are you wasting your time doing these things? You have done sales all all your life. That's what you should be doing. Uh, So I started doing sales. Advertising was something I always wanted to do since I was a kid. So I did it initially for print. uh, And then once I saw the internet, I was like, oh, this is where I want to be. I need to be part of this. So I started working for startups in the late 90s doing sales, uh, digital advertising. And as I learned the business, uh, I moved from one company to the next, uh, progressed from salesperson to sales manager to director of sales until I finally uh, had the chance to move on my own and start my own company with a friend of mine. 
and we built it in 2004. Uh, we made the Inc. 500 three years in a row and sold the company in 2008. We were doing close to $12 million in revenue by then with a very small team, by the way. Yeah, so I think you, one of your uh, key points in in that journey, and it is quite quite the journey. I mean, going from homeless for for almost five years and doing that door to door selling, I, I know it will resonate with so many of our listeners who are you know maybe wanting to get into their first startup to get to that exciting time where where it all starts. Um, but one of the things you said there was learning you know how to communicate with people, and and that really is an absolute pillar for. You know, any even if you're going into marketing or selling or whatever it is you're you're starting up, uh, learning to communicate is one of the key points there. I think. Yeah, it, it is absolutely that, and, and the ability to continue to move forward. Um, I think persistence has been, as I mentioned, the key to a lot of the things that I have done. And when I was selling door to door. Uh, there were days that you just knock on a hundred doors and you hear no, no, no every single time and learning how to bounce back and continue pushing forward. That's, that's a key for anybody. Anybody who wants to start a business, who want to be involved in a startup, there is a lot of no, there's a lot of rejection. It is part of the game. And if you take it personally and it lets you, you let it affect you, then you're not going to be able to bounce back. You need to keep moving forward. And this goes for, people who are in sports or acting or anything else. There's always a lot of no's in life and that's the difference between the people who give up on what they want to do and those who continue to push forward and get better. So you said uh, we'll, we'll keep that um, movement and momentum going uh, on on the journey that we're going through in this podcast and I think you know one of the one of the things we want to want to talk about is how you've started uh, that business yourself and how you actually got that initial momentum you know what what sort of sparked the idea and then what were the first few steps that you took to to actually get the ball rolling sure um i was working at a company called equifax equifax is a fortune 500 company one of the startups that i was involved in where i was doing sales uh, was acquired by equifax so i ended up being part of a team uh, that sold digital products. Equifax is mostly a data company. They do a lot of the postal data. They're, you know, they're about a hundred years old. Uh, so when I was doing digital sales and selling data, I carved a niche on the market research side. I started working with a lot of market research companies selling data to them. And it got to the point that I had quite a few clients and having a conversation with one of my coworkers, I posted the idea of, hey, if you and I left and took all of the clients that we have just to do this one particular segment on the market research, I'm sure we could build out an interesting product that was not competitive to what we're doing at the time, but it would fill a need. Market research companies were buying lots of data. Uh, So we started with the hypothesis, which is how all business start, right? You see a need on the marketplace, you have this hypothesis, this idea that you can probably feel that need if you build a product uh, that plugs right into that specific hole that is in the marketplace. So we started building custom surveys online and and we will sell data to market research companies. So we, we started with one website and started building more and more. And I, I guess the key of how to get started, obviously we had some clients, we had been selling to these clients for a couple of years. Uh, the only decision here was to just quit your job and go and do it, which I don't recommend, by the way. If you're thinking of getting into a startup or building something, um, since most of the startups fail and some of the hypotheses that people have are wrong, my suggestion is you start doing it part-time. After you work on the weekends and nights, start building simple versions of what your product will look like and experiment with those and once you see a little bit of traction and you begin to make money then you can make the decision of quitting your job and moving full time. So in my case I quit my job, my friend and colleague at the time did that as well and we found a third person who helped us build the product and the three of us went on our own and we didn't take any salaries, any money, it took us four or five months to start making a little bit of money but eventually it was a very successful business. And I think, you know, your your major point there is, you know, don't just go and quit the job. 
excuse me, don't just go and quit the job, you know, straight away and go, right, I'm just going to go into this because, you know, I believe in it wholeheartedly. And, and yes, you might do, but it's so important to test small, as you said. Just uh, I think people get very carried away in this now society that we can have. You know, we can have things almost delivered by drone the very next day. You know, it's, it's that uh, very much now we want it instantly. And business success just doesn't work like that. You know, I've been hacking away at my uh, digital agency for 12 years to get it to where it is now. And, you know, even launching this more demand brand, I know it's going to take three to five years to really build up any momentum. And it's that persistence and drive, as you said, that's so, so important. So, um, so listeners out there, you know, don't just think, right, I'm going to quit it. Uh, Do it after hours, put in an hour early morning, or even, you know, a couple of hours in the evening, um, when the kids are gone to bed and and really start to build something and create something that you can then test the feasibility of your hypothesis or or your ideas um so once once you've you've done that and you've you've created you know maybe a, a minimum viable product or you've you know come up with some some ideas that you've actually got people to to sort of uh, hand money over uh, what what do you think is the next logical step I mean there's this whole piece around branding and how important branding is to to um, you know a new or, or existing business I mean do you think that that branding is is somewhere people should start or do you think that you should start somewhere different no I think you need to start with your hypothesis right as entrepreneurs have uh, sort of delusion, if you will, which is, is quite healthy if you keep it in check, uh, because you need you need this idea that what you're building is spectacular and it's the greatest thing, and it's just a little bit of delusion there. Um, but it helps because when things are tough, you need to have a little bit of that to continue delivering on your idea. But the reality is the market will tell you. The market really will tell you. There is a need for your product. Can you get someone to pay you money for what you're doing? Can you really uh, scale? Is there a large enough market that you can make money with? And and that's really the, the idea. Most people believe that a startup is a company, and a startup is more of a experiment, if you will. It's really not a company yet. Once you have this experiment and you get it to work, you have to be flexible enough to understand that what you wanted to accomplish may need some tweaks and you may need to change a lot of things. So the brand part of the whole story is really the promise that you're delivering, whether to a business, to a client, or to a consumer. And the branding aspect comes with that idea of what is the promise that you're delivering. Is it service? Is it issue of use? Um, you know, whatever that may be, that's kind of the brand experience. Yeah, I like that. The the you know, so many people get had up in the early stages going, Oh, I'm gonna go and create a you know, a lovely looking brand in terms of digital assets like logo and, you know, the, the color palette and typography and they get so muddled up in that world then they're not concentrating on actually what does the brand mean in terms of as you said what are you delivering what are the values what do you truly believe in as a brand you know why are you on uh, this planet to to serve people you know why why uh, answer that question you know that's the uh, that's the why um, and I've completely forgotten the uh, the TEDx talk um, the why I've mentioned it a thousand times on the podcast but I just keep hammering it at people because go and listen to that first you know people buy what you do uh, n- sorry people buy why you do it not what you do um so yeah go and have a have a listen to uh, to that tedx talk i'll link to it in the show notes but um but yeah as you said promising what you're delivering so how did you do that in in your business what were some of the the identifiers that you thought you know this really differentiates us and this is what we believe in as, as a brand yeah, um, well, the, the challenge for a lot of the market research in the early 2000s was the idea of building a panel. And panel market research is a fancy word for an email database. Market research companies build panels that they can get information from, and then they sell this customized reports and studies to brands. So if, let's say McDonald's wants to launch a new breakfast menu, uh, instead of going and spending millions of dollars and going into the marketplace and launching this, they hire a market research company, they go through their panel and they build customized surveys and studies to understand what is the need in the marketplace. Is there a need for a particular new menu? What is the pricing strategy? What kind of items people want? 
So this whole process of building these panels is very essential for market research companies. The channel, the, the challenge that the companies had at the time, these market research companies had in the early 2000s, was that a lot of that stuff was done either through telemarketing, uh, a lot of the surveys were done through telemarketing, or they were actually mail uh, the surveys, paper surveys. So we knew that we could do it cheaper and more effectively by building the surveys online. We knew that if we could drive to right consumers through a survey process on the internet, we could cleanse the data, uh, we could get them to answer questions, we'll offer some sort of incentive. Um, so we knew that a study that will take three months, we could do it probably in two weeks, and a study that regularly will cost $100,000, we could probably do for about 15% of that. So that was our hypothesis, was we can do a lot of the market research, both the acquisition of people who wanted to opt in into a panel, as well as some of the studies online for cheaper and more effectively. Uh, and that's when we went into the market. We went to promise market research companies, we can save you time and money by doing this online as opposed to you continue to hiring telemarketers, which obviously it has migrated online now from them, but we were one of the very few first companies that started doing it effectively at a scale during the early 2000s. So how did you sort of test or, or how could you I think I think the the market research piece is actually so important as a as a wider story for people to test their hypothesis their business ideas so what would you say to people that you know want to to go and test those ideas that that they've got that you know they've sat in the pub with their mates and they've gone oh, I've got this brilliant business idea um and and what what would be the way to to really test that idea out <laughs> Well, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, the important thing you mentioned testing and you mentioned friends um, is it, be careful with the feedback that you receive. When you're building a startup and you're doing something from scratch, you need to make sure that you're getting the right feedback. And what that means is maybe your friends are not the particular audience that you're looking to target. If all your friends are wealthy, and you're building a product for people who are not at the same income level and the same level of education, feedback that you get may not be the right feedback. So that's an important thing in terms of getting feedback. Uh, I always, always tell every entrepreneur and people that I work with, just because someone says you're not doing something right, it doesn't mean that's the case. You need to get feedback from the right audience. So my advice is, you build a very simple presentation or if you're doing it on a website, send the link to people uh, that you are targeting. And you can do this in social media. There are actually platforms that allow you to do this. You can do it on platforms like Reddit and other places online when you can get feedback from other people and, and your idea. Um, but the, the trick is obviously who are you selling the product to and who is your target audience and get feedback from that particular segment of the market, not just your friends. I mean, I guess it's okay that your friends may give you a little bit of feedback on, on what you're doing, but the important thing is that you target the right audience. Um, otherwise, it's probably not going to be very useful on a long-term basis. Yeah, and I think the the key part there is as as well as get people to actually vote with their wallet, get their wallet out and pay for something, even if it's you know really early bird value added discount, um, you know whatever it is to to entice those initial um, beta testers um, and get them you know using your product early on, so that uh, you know even if it's an informational product, you could even if you don't want to give a discount, you could still give a value add like you know an hour of your time post purchase and you know things like that to, to just add a bit more value so that they know they're getting something um, for being in in there nice and early as well so uh, that's a, a great way to test and I like the the fact that you said you know um, don't just ask for your friends feedback because you know that could be bias and they're not the right target audience either so it's nice that um, you know people are having conversations with uh, you know people that they don't know as well which is which is really important which the market research companies did in in the old school ways as as you were mentioning so where in that test process do you think uh you know how would you identify things that you need to to change and then potentially pivot i mean what sort of uh triggers would you be looking out for 
I'll give you a very specific example. I just launched a company um, in, in December. We started. We launched a product in February called LiveVote, and LiveVote allows brands to capture emotional sentiments from their audience, first-party data, and create a new way of monetizing content that was not previously monetized. So when I started the, the company and we started going to the market, we had those three things in mind. Capture emotional sentiment, capture first party data, and provide a new avenue of monetization. We started going to beta testers and we allowed them to use the platform for free. We have a little bit over 50 beta testers today, but when we started with some of them, we looked at metrics and we started measuring are we really increasing engagement? And we realized we needed to make changes. Increasing engagement was not as high. That has changed dramatically just because of having beta testers that were actually running our technology so we could look at data, make decisions. So when you have this idea in your mind of what is the value proposition, what is it that is unique about your product, you need to validate that. And you mentioned either someone paying for the product in our case, we give it away for free and we let them use it for a month. Uh, this way we could capture enough, enough data and then say, are we really doing and living up to our promise? Are we really increasing engagement? Are we allowing publishers to capture data? Are we creating a new monetization strategy? And, and the data will give you the numbers, you'll see. Um, but that's how you pivot, that's how you look at data and you begin to look at what's not working. For, for my primary value proposition, is there something that needs to be improved? Uh, are we missing a segment of the market or are we not living up to expectation? And you get feedback relatively quickly. The, the challenge for most entrepreneurs is, as I mentioned, this, this idea of this dilution of thinking, you know, I'm a little bit delusional about what I think I'm going to do. And I'm very rigid about not changing my mind. And that's that's very difficult. You, you need to be flexible and understand that, you know, maybe you had a, a, an original hypothesis of something you wanted to test and do, and the market is telling you a different story. If you watch the show Shark Tank, I'm amazed at people that go there, and they've been doing this for two, three, four, five years, and they're still not getting results. And everyone is in the panel telling them, well, you really need to change this. And they're like, nope, nope, I'm not going to do it. And, and that's really part of the whole process of, uh, of iteration, looking at your product, iterate on your product, make changes as you move along, and take the feedback and incorporate it into making it a better product. Yeah, I think I, I just recently read a book called uh, Essentialism. Um, in fact, it's called The Disciplined Pursuit of, uh, of Less by Greg McCowan. And uh, in there, he mentioned exactly what, what you've just said, that you know people have a sunk cost in uh, an idea. They've invested all of their time, not necessarily money, but they're so emotionally attached to the idea that they don't spot the warning signs that are telling them, you know, you've got to pivot. And that, I think, is where uh, you start to migrate from someone that is simply starting a business to someone who is entrepreneurial. Because I think so many people just use this entrepreneur badge or emblem and you know it's almost like a a trophy as it were you know I'm an entrepreneur um you know sort of the the so what mentality but it it takes it, I think it does define people that understand that uh, you know they can have that emotional disconnect um and and completely understand the the business behind it and they're not afraid to make changes um you know take risks in some cases and to understand where their skills lack and where they want to to bring people into uh, into the business so when you were setting up uh, live vote talk us through some of the the early stage you said you um, co-founded it with uh, a few other people and then how did you sort of realize what were some of the point um, decision points where you went okay we need to expand the team or we need to um, you know take on additional resource what did that look like Oh, Lawrence, LiveVote is my new company now that I'm running. Uh, the company I mentioned in the early 2000s was Iron Traffic that I funded with three friends. Sure. Uh, so diff different company. So with, with my friends, uh, we started with this hypothesis of acquiring data for market research companies. Uh, we found out early on that the technology could be applied for many things. We could do lead generation for 
uh, insurance companies, for um, mortgage companies, etc. And we realized quickly as we started testing those different markets that they were very different, different audience, different way of buying media, and our real true value was on the market research. 80% of all of our clients and revenue came from that. Um, so we learned quickly to stay focused on the thing that we wanted to do. Uh, and then we started bringing people to help us on the media buying side to increase uh, and scale and you know go through there. But uh, you know, mentioning what you just said, I, I always say this, I've been on both sides. I've been a founder or a CEO, but I've also been on the consulting side, uh, helping CEOs and founders. And I always see what you mentioned about being not very flexible in terms of making decisions. And I tell people all the time, you have a choice. You can either be right or you can make money. But it's usually very hard to have both. So when you're with- <laughs> I love that quote. That's brilliant. Uh, yeah, so uh, so with, with that, you know, going back to where we where we started this conversation with that, that drive, desire, and persistence, I mean, what are some of the... What are some of the the day-to-day things that help you get through the persistence? I mean, how do you manage? Uh, Because I think some of it is natural that you you will just have that drive because you've got that belief in, in in the hypothesis, in the idea. But are there any sort of systematic things that you do to to help not only yourself but your team um, have the same desire and and persistence to to achieve a a common goal? Yeah. um Running a business is not as exciting as most people think. It's a very repetitive thing. It's it's really the key to a lot of these things is just do the same thing again and again and do it well. So I meet with a lot of companies. I do demos with my technology now. Um, I go and I meet with either TV channels or digital publishers and I show them live vote, how it works, how it increases engagement. And it reminds me of uh, when you go to Broadway, right? If you go to Broadway and you see this play and people are singing and doing and you're like, wow, it's the best play I've seen. People that are there doing the play have been doing it sometimes for years and every day they have to do the same thing over and over again. But the passion they bring to it is what makes it unique and exciting for anyone who's seeing them. And it's similar on a, on a company. When you're doing demos, you may say the same thing again and again and again, but the person who's listening to you is the first time they're hearing your pitch is the first time they're listening and, and learning about your product and that's kind of the key of, of working on a lot of these startups. You have to become really good at doing the same things over and over and then make changes to increase performance. What What's working, whether we're doing email campaigns or we're cold calling or we're doing demos, the little things that you get in terms of feedback you improve upon it and you become better at it. And it's the same thing with metrics, with traffic we're getting, engagement metrics. You look at these numbers, it's a repetitive process and then you improve upon it. So it's not as exciting as a lot of people make it out to be, but you know, you have the passion, you love the product, you see the vision of what you want to do, then absolutely it becomes an interesting exercise of, of improvement. Little by little, you make changes. When you look back six months from today you're like wow it's a, we're a very different place than we were six months ago yeah and those small little incremental changes add up to a massive difference and i liken that to um you know british cycling's uh, great triumphs in the olympics a few years where dave brailsford had the uh, marginal gains campaign where he just looked at the 0.5 percent and the even the 0.25 percent uh, gains that he could have throughout the entire team you know i i know even in the hotels they had uh, their uh, particular riders pillows that they liked and air conditioning they took over the kitchen themselves and they just knew everything about these riders and it's so important to have that foundation of knowledge about your business you know and uh, I was just reading uh, rework by 37 signals and in there they mentioned that actually you should do all of these things like you're saying those repetitive tasks do them yourself until it's so painful that you can't do it yourself anymore and then it's time to to bring in resource because you'll understand exactly who you're hiring for what and then how to train them as well right no you're absolutely right I had a mentor who, um, when I started doing sales very early on in my life, he used to say, 
you know, the person that is out there selling, making sales, is not a hundred or two hundred percent better than you at all. It's maybe five percent, maybe three percent, but he's getting a hundred percent of the sales and the commissions, and you're getting zero. And and that put things into perspective. I, I don't have to be a hundred percent better tomorrow, but I can improve a couple of percentage points. And I can improve on how I communicate, the things that I say, the words that I use. Uh, and all these things are, as you mentioned, a process, little by little. And I think it's just kind of part of the society that we live in. We want everything today, as you mentioned at the beginning. And we feel like, you know, I'm going to jump on a new thing and I'm going to be an expert tomorrow. And, and that's just really not how it works. It takes time and experience and effort to become really excellent in one single thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I was, in fact, I was just sat with uh, a client yesterday who said, uh, do you know what, Lawrence, this business, even though it was in, in the service industry, he said, it's exactly like setting up a factory. You've got to think that initially when you first set out, what's your factory? Well, it's a team of one, maybe, maybe two if you're co-founding it with someone. How much can you actually produce? You know, how many widgets can you produce in, in a day in your factory? And then you think, right, how do I scale this? How how do I systemize it? How do I, uh, you know, create those processes that will allow me to to scale and leverage um, everything that, that I've built within the business? And and that is, you know, the perfect analogy of thinking it like a, like a factory. Once you build up all these processes, you're just building and building bigger and bigger uh, on on the foundations that that you've created within, you know, but still being true to to your hypothesis and your your brand values, as you said. So. Right. Um, so yeah, I think we're we're coming up to the to the half hour of the uh, of the show. So um, I'd like to just sort of finish off with some uh, you know a bit of advice for um, you know where people can find out more about uh, LiveVo and about yourself and uh, and yeah any final uh, final tips. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. LiveVo. You can visit LiveVo. dot com. You can learn about live vote for consumers and publishers as well and how we bring content to life, make it truly interactive. If you want to learn more about my bio, my story, my books, you can visit my personal website, which is edderholgin.com. Uh, and advice, look, I, the reality, three things I learned in life. If you really want something, you have to go for it. It's not going to come to you. And you have to be persevering enough to not give up on the things that you really want. Uh, there are times in my life, and as a lot of people probably will tell you the same thing, when things seem unattainable, they seem so far away, but when you persevere and you push yourself forward, they begin to come into place, and, and nothing will replace that. Uh, the desire and the perseverance that you have within you is really what's going to be the payoff for the things you want to achieve in life. That's, that's the best advice I can give you. Well, that's awesome. And I can resonate with that. You know, the rewards of when things start to click and they start to click fast is is simply amazing. And I know everyone out there will get uh, a load of value from today's podcast. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lauren. No problem. And that's it for another episode of the More Demand Podcast. We'll make sure to see you next Wednesday. Thanks for listening to the More Demand Podcast. Make sure to hit that subscribe button on iTunes and get the latest episode direct to your device every Wednesday.